Dr. Omar Zoya, Dr. Lutfi Rahimi, and dear participants, Namaste and good afternoon. Welcome to the NICE Economy Lecture Series. Through NICE Economy Lecture Series, we aim to invite eminent economists to discuss the contemporary economic issues at the time when the world is struggling with post-COVID recovery, which has further been hit by the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Before we start, let me briefly introduce NICE Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is a research think tank registered under the Company Act 2006 of Nepal, working towards bringing in research excellence in the field of international relations, international economy, security, and development, and looking for better approaches for enhanced international cooperation and relations for a better, peaceful, and stable world. To talk about today's important issue, Afghanistan's economic development, and lessons learned. We have Dr. Omar Zoya and Dr. Lutfi Rahimi from Biruni Institute, Kabul, Afghanistan. Now, without any delay, let me introduce the eminent speaker of today's program, Dr. Omar Zoya and Dr. Lutfi Rahimi. Dr. Omar Zoya is executive director and founding member of Biruni Institute, Kabul, Afghanistan. He is an economist with nearly 10 years of experience in working with international institutions the Afghan government and academia. His latest employment include working for the World Bank as a country economist for Afghanistan in Kabul and in Washington DC for more than five years and teaching at the American University of Afghanistan as an assistant professor of economics for, the th for three years. He also worked for the Central Bank of Afghanistan and the Afghanistan Investment Support Agency. Dr. Zoya holds a PhD in economics from the University of Bordeaux, France. He has published several research papers in peer-reviewed journals, including the European Economic Review, Economics of Transitions, and Structural Change and Economic Dynamics. Dr. Zoya is also a researcher at the Bordeaux School of Economics and was a visiting fellow to University of Oxford from 2019 to 2020. We also have Dr. Lutfi Rahimi with us, Dr. Lutfi Rahimi is a head of research at the Birini Institutes and an assistant professor of economics at the American University of Afghanistan. He previously worked as a senior advisor to the Minister of Economy, economy and as a tax consultant at the World Bank Country Office. Dr. Rahimi holds a PhD in economics from the University of Leicester, United Kingdom. He, he has BC in economics from the University of Exeter sorry, in University of Essex and MSc in Economics from the University of Exeter. His PhD research focused on behavioral dimensions of tax compliance and labor supply and the effects of public service delivery methods to deal with corruption. His current research activities at the Biruni Institute include applied microeconomic analysis, tax policy, regional cooperation, and development economics. Dr. Omar Zoya and Dr. Lutfi Rahimi, you have around 35 to 40 minutes to make your initial remarks, which will be followed by the questions and answers. This session is of 60 minutes, and the program is streaming live on several Facebook pages and social media platforms. We would like to request all our participants to tweet about the event and also share our live video on their social media to the maximum, so that the maximum can benefit from the discussion. The audience can drop in their questions under Facebook Live or in Zoom chat. Dr. Zoya and Dr. Rahimi, over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Chaudhary. Um, good afternoon to all the participants. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Mr. Chaudhary. Uh, we are very pleased to uh, be speaking um, in these uh, series of, of webinars that the uh, uh, Nepal Institute for International Cooperation uh, uh, maintains. Uh, um, I, we have uh, a presentation prepared. Let me share the screen. Um, I hope you can uh, see the, the presentation. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, perhaps a, a, a very brief in, in introduction to the Biruni Institute. Uh, uh, Biruni Institute uh, was founded in, in 2019 in, in Kabul, Afghanistan um, and, uh, as, a, as an economic policy think tank. Uh, 
uh, and we have been working uh, with the government of Afghanistan, the, the previous government of Afghanistan, the international community, and other institutions in the country on economic policy and, 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 and development issues uh, uh, related to Afghanistan. Um, and today in, in our talk, uh, uh, Dr. Lutfi Rahimi, my colleague, and I will be uh, uh, giving you an overview of the economic performance and uh, some of the development challenges that existed in Afghanistan in the past two decades, mainly from uh, 2002 until uh, last year, uh, 2021. Um, so uh, in, in this presentation, we'll, we will look at uh, um, uh, growth performance, uh, we'll discuss the financing gap uh, in Afghanistan. Um, we'll also have a look at the uh, poverty in the country. And then uh, the second uh, uh, part of the presentation, we'll, we'll have a discussion on the political economy aspects of development uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, before we, we start with uh, looking at the economic performance of the country, perhaps, uh, it might be useful to to give a recap of the uh, of the political uh, developments in Afghanistan uh, since 2001, just to refresh uh, uh, memories of 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 everyone of of the participants here. Um, so, following the September 11th um, uh, incident in 2001, uh, we all recall that the United States um, executed an attack on 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 the Taliban back then in Afghanistan and then maintained a security presence in the country together with other NATO members. Um, uh, as of 2009, there were about 60,000 troops, uh, NATO troops in the country, uh, and it further increased to about 130,000 troops uh, by 2011. Uh, uh, then, um, uh, President uh, Obama took the decision to withdraw most of the NATO troops from Afghanistan, and this gradual withdrawal was uh, was executed uh, over the course of two years, from 2012 to 2014. Um, um, and and after 2014, around seven to ten thousand troops uh, remained uh, in the in the country, but almost all security responsibilities were transferred to the Afghan National Security Forces, um, uh, which was com composed of the police force and also the army. Um, overall, uh, uh, in, in the past two decades, uh, Afghanistan received massive foreign aid, including both civilian and security aid. Um, and, and we'll talk more about this, but I can uh, um, but let me give, um, let me briefly mention that on average, 85% uh, of total public spending in Afghanistan over the past two decades were financed by foreign aid. And uh, cumulatively, we in the Biruni Institute, we estimate uh, that um, Afghanistan received about $160 billion in foreign aid cumulatively. Uh, until um, 2021. Uh, and with, with this extensive amount of foreign aid, of course, there were uh, extensive economic development in all areas, in human development, infrastructure, governance, uh, civil society, human rights in, in, in all fronts. Um, uh, and then two very important uh, political um, uh, uh, political incidents were the fact that the United States signed a peace agreement with the Taliban in February 2020, and then which led to the political collapse uh, in August last year um, and the regime change. Uh, so let's have a look at the uh, growth performance uh, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, so here in this chart, we see real GDP growth uh, since 2003 until last year. And if, and if you look at this graph, we'll see that uh, we, we, can, we, we would identify two different phases. First, um, 
Uh, from 2003 all up to uh, 2012, uh, economic growth was um, economic growth in in Afghanistan was highly volatile uh, from one year to another. But the average economic growth was very significant. Uh, so the average real GDP growth during this period was about 9.5 percent from or 9.8 percent, uh, which is quite uh, considerable and uh, it's unmatched in in Central Asia or even in in in, in South Asia. Uh, the reason that the economic growth was volatile was that uh, the um, that it was driven by volatilities in agriculture sector. With poor irrigation system, uh, we um, uh, and with the climatic shocks and changes in the precipitation levels. So agriculture uh, production uh, varied from one year to, an, to another. And given the huge um, uh, size of the agriculture sector in Afghanistan, overall economic growth tended to be volatile. But then once after the uh, security transition was concluded, meaning that the security trans, uh, responsibilities were transferred to the Afghan National Security Forces, growth suddenly declined. So what happened? Um, actually, during this period, uh, uh, as soon as the United States and NATO announced that they, that they would be withdrawing most of their troops from Afghanistan, and that the, all the security responsibilities will be transferred to uh, the government of Afghanistan, there was a sudden panic uh, in the country. So people recalled the withdrawal of the Soviet Union back in, in end uh, uh, 1980, uh, after which civil war broke, uh, broke out in the country. There was a sudden panic, uh, in, uh, investment dropped, um, a lot of entrepreneurs um, uh, suspended their, their investment projects, um, capital flight started, and even people uh, stopped paying taxes. And in 2012, until 2000 and um, there was a fiscal shock. And in 2014, the country entered into a fiscal crisis. Uh, revenues dropped considerably. Uh, there was a huge fiscal gap. And uh, the government had to um, reduce its expenditures and, uh, and, and, and mobilize additional uh, resources. Um, but even after the uh, transition, security transition, growth remained very, uh, very low as a result of uh, increased uh, insecurity and, and conflict in the country. And uh, growth never picked up uh, or never went beyond 2.5%. And uh, during the COVID um, uh, epidemic, and um, especially with the political incidents last year, we uh, the country um, uh, has been in an economic recession, uh, and it has been contracting quite uh, considerably. Um, but the fact that uh, the economic growth uh, remained very since 2014 uh, does not mean that uh, there weren't any economic developments afterwards. So here in this graph, I've put a few indicators just to show the magnitude of development that took place in the country uh, financed by foreign aid. Uh, so you'll see that income per capita, of course, increased uh, by threefold from 2002 to 2013, but then slightly dropped uh, until 2020 because uh, economic growth um, uh, went below the uh, population uh, growth rate. Um, poverty, uh, um, uh, on the other hand, increased uh, contrary to expectations, despite the massive aid flows. Um, and, and this indicates that um, uh, the economic growth in the country was not pro poor. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about this. Um, in the education sector, we, have, we, we had uh, uh, massive achievements. Uh, for instance, secondary school enrollment increased from 12% in 2002 to about 55% in 2018. In the health sector, you know, for instance, uh, maternal mortality rate dropped from 1,300 cases to, to about 600 in, in 2017. 
Um, and this is just one, one indicator. And you'll see that there was uh, extensive progress in, in, in most of the health indicators across the board in the country in the past two decades. Also, for instance, in, in other areas of, um, uh, of, of development and infrastructure, for instance, access to electricity and even uh, telecommunications, they increased quite significantly um, over the past two decades. Um, but the most important challenge perhaps in the country in the past two decades was the financing gap in the country. Uh, in this slide, uh, I have put uh, two slides. Uh, so first, uh, uh, two, two charts, excuse me. So the, uh, the chart on the left shows public spending in the country um, in, in billion US dollars from 2002 to 2020. And public, we have broken this up into on budget and off budget. Uh, this is perhaps a, um, um, a special case in Afghanistan where a lot of the foreign aid in the country were spent off budget, meaning they were directly spend, spent and executed by the donors through NGOs, either international NGOs or local NGOs. Um, um, and the government did, did not have any discretion um, either in the planning or in the execution of, 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 that, uh, of that money. So this is the off-budget spending, which is colored in, in blue. And then we have the, the, the government's own budget uh, colored in reddish color. Uh, um, and, and this was uh, principally the, uh, the operational and development budget of the government itself, which was again financed um, quite extensively by foreign aid. So what you'll see is that public spending uh, comprising both on budget, uh, off budget and on budget uh, spending in the country um, had reached about $60 billion per year in, in 2011 when there was a peak of foreign aid inflows in the country and also the fact that and this was just prior to the security transition. After the security transition, overall foreign aid started to decline and this reduction was mostly happening on the off-budget front. This other chart on the right uh, was, uh, was a chart that I had prepared when I was working at the World Bank. And here it showed the prospects for, um, uh, for, the, uh, for revenue mobilization until 2030 that we were uh, expecting uh, back then, uh, two or three years ago. Um, so uh, based on the analysis that we had done that the domestic revenue capacity in the country, uh, the maximum revenue that, that Afghanistan could generate did not exceed about 17% of GDP. Yet the public spending needs were almost double uh, that, that level. And there was a huge external financing gap. So until uh, 2018 or until uh, 2021, this external financing gap was financed by foreign aid. But even when we were looking uh, to the foreseeable future, we did not expect uh, Afghanistan to be able to fully finance its expenditure and needs. Um, so, so this was one of the um, uh, exceptional cases, I think, or perhaps one of the few exceptional cases in the world where uh, the country received massive amounts of foreign aid uh, and yet uh, were, was not able to improve its fiscal sustainability over the course of 20 years. And uh, it kept, uh, and the uh, dependence on foreign aid kept increasing and uh, increasing. Um, on, on, on poverty, uh, uh, the, the poverty headcount ratio um, um, increased uh, from about 33% back in, in 20, uh, 2007 to about 55% in 2016 and then slightly moderated to 47% uh, by 2020. And this shows that the economic growth process in Afghanistan was not pro poor, uh, despite the fact that there was um, a consistent um, 
um, consistent discussion about poverty in the country by the donors and by the government, uh, we, we failed to have uh, um, an economic growth that would benefit the poor more than the others. Um, uh, and as such, despite the, despite the massive aid inflows, uh, poverty failed to, to decline. Uh, so what you'll see is that even prior to the economic transition, prior to 2014, uh, poverty was still high, um, despite the fact that economic growth was, was significant, about 9% on average per year, poverty was still higher. And then after the transition, it, it, it uh, deteriorated even further, poverty increased to about 55%. Um, um, so here, the these red dots are the poverty rate. The, the, the blue line is the uh, real GDP economic growth rate. And uh, I've also put the population growth rate, which is about 2.5%. Uh, uh, so you'll see that when economic growth fell below the uh, population growth rate, um, poverty increased uh, to about 50% um, in the past few uh, years. Um, uh, what this shows is that the relation between poverty and economic growth in Afghanistan was, was quite um, paradoxical. For instance, poverty increased between 2007 and 2016, um, during which economic growth was still significant and we kept receiving massive aid inflows, but then it declined over 2016, 2020, when economic growth was, was, um, uh, was, um, was declining and uh, conflict intensified. And, and if we looked at the uh, um, spatial variations, poverty tended to be lower in provinces where uh, conflict was high. And um, perhaps this, uh, the, the fact that there was this inverse relation between poverty and, and, and conflict, it could be explained by the fact that in uh, provinces that were that were in conflict, the government and the uh, donor community uh, tried to pour more foreign aid into those provinces, um, just the fact to, um, to to encourage more development and to discourage um, in, in, in insurgency. So I'll stop here, and then my colleague Dr. Rahimi will uh, will be. Uh, presenting the next few slides, uh, discussing broadly about the uh, political economy challenges of the development. Uh, I will stop the screen sharing on my end, and Dr. Rahimi, you can... Um, uh, I don't know how I should... Okay, I think it's... Then over to you, Dr. Rahim. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you should be able to see my screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I think this is where we stopped. So without um, any preliminaries, I should continue as Joseph said. Um, so I will um, talk about some of the aspects of the development narratives and discourses, if you like, that kind of uh, encompasses uh, a wider discussion of the context of Afghanistan and how these uh, um, indicators mean something or how they don't mean um, the first, so this, this helps us understand basically factors beyond the traditional macroeconomic overview, if you like. So it kind of complements what has already been discussed and helps us make sense of some of those. Of course, it's not going to be a very comprehensive list, but um, um, gives you a glimpse of what was going on for the last two decades. Um, it, it helps us get a partial picture. So. First um, thing is that development is a multi-dimensional uh, issue. And uh, as, as it was mentioned earlier on, growth failed to be pro-poor and 
urban and rural divide continued to widen. Uh, and this was the theme throughout the two decades. So as you can see, some of these indicators you know, have put there uh, addition, in addition to the initial indicators. So these are HDI, um, the uh, gender development, uh, gender inequality index, uh, MPI, which is a multidimensional poverty index that sort of captures or presents a better image of how poverty is and the perception of corruption. Um, most of these, Afghanistan was performing, um, underperforming, let's say, and performing badly compared to other South Asia countries, South Asian nations. So for example, in the gender uh, development index, it was in the fifth group, which is the furthest away from gender parity, whereas group one is usually, so there are five groups and group five is the lowest one. Or like in gender inequality index, um, Afghanistan was ranked 157 out of 162 countries. Uh, the MPI considered Afghanistan as a poor country, which is a very, very vulnerable uh, category to be in. Um, some of the national policy papers that kind of was in existence throughout these two uh, decades, uh, one called National Development Strategy, or Afghanistan's national development strategy between 2005 to 2000, around 2012, and then Afghanistan's national peace and development framework between 2015 uh, to 2021. So these are estimates and rough figures. They laid out the official narrative with regard to prosperity and how to achieve well being, and the vision and the structures that would deliver some of those macro objectives. So uh, these national policy levers kind of endorsed, they were endorsed by the, uh, by the international um, community and aid pledging countries uh, for Afghanistan as well. And these development approaches in these national level papers for about two, 20 years could be uh, classified as what you may call a needs-based or a short-term remedies for kind of catching low-hanging fruits. And lack of security, low levels of human capital, um, conflict in aligning kind of donor interests and priorities within Afghanistan were some of the rhetorics that uh, blamed uh, the fact that uh, these these policies weren't being as effective as they could have been. But so in hindsight, I think the slide is the slide has not changed. Uh, it's only on my um, uh, yes yes I will I will I will I will pay attention to the slides as well. <laughs> um, so it kind of. Um, the unprecedented level of attention that Afghanistan received, you would expect a much more multi-dimensional development to occur during this period. You know, uh, and the failure to understand the importance of that level of aid that was discussed earlier on, and the the 160, the, the 60 billion uh, um, dollars of aid to exploit the opportunity to grow or the failure to appreciate the gravity of this, this level of attention, which is both financial and technical during these 20 years, um, could be found in two places. One is internally, you know, the factors and um, reasons domestically that contributed or inhibited or hindered that development to happen. And then part of the other part of the equation is, um, in the international arrangements and methods that kind of um, created an antagonism, you know, internally inside Afghanistan, and they were not very compromising or understanding of the contextual reasons. So, <clears throat> with that, um, some of the some of the most important, so one of the most important that as we've been talking about was aid. Some of the most important and special features of Afghanistan's economy was aid. 
So let me just begin by un unpicking some issues or, or some of the themes that concern aid, as it was one of the, uh, it was the driving force behind the development and economic achievements we saw. So basically, um, to give you an overview of how it worked, every four years, there was a, uh, an international pledging conference on Afghanistan. Uh, most donors would gather with the government of Afghanistan and then they would um, donate a certain amount of money or pledge that they would donate a certain amount of money for the next four years for reconstruction and security support of the country. And these rolling four years pledging conferences would happen every four years in a different city. Uh, one of the most, I think, Im important developments in this series of conferences was the separation of development from military aid packages in 2012, and that was right before the security transition that um, Dr. Juya was mentioning, and this happened in a Tokyo um, pledging conference. Um, the way the aid was spent was either on budget or off budget. And this delivery of aid in Afghanistan became a heated matter of debate between the state and the international donors and the international insti institutions, um, arguing uh, which method of delivery was more effective. So the government was arguing naturally that on budget assistance would bring greater efficiency, enhanced uh, economic multiplier. Uh, multiplier effects, uh, maybe better alignment of donor and government priorities, uh, reinforces government legitimacy and efficiency all around the country when aid is spent via, via the state. Uh, and some of the examples or the successful examples used to support these arguments were things like uh, projects like National Health Program or National Agriculture Program or uh, there was another program, National Solidarity or Citizens Charter Program, that kind of, this National Solidarity Program worked through a network of over 20,000 local communities that kind of developed their own project, local projects, and then, then they were given funding to, 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 to implement. Um, a kind of the argument became very, very dominant. And for instance, you know, the World Bank did an analysis that showed that the proportion of each dollar, US dollar, that was reaching Afghanistan through on budget assistance was um, much higher than off budget assistance. For example, they showed that each dollar was more uh, reaching Afghanistan was through on budget was 0 0.58. So basically 58 cents, whereas off budget dollar was only 20 cents. The kind of and the overhead costs associated to on budget was much lower. So um, the argument was almost won basically by the on budget discussions. Despite all of that, between 2008 to 2019, for example, um, the percentage of on budget delivery just increased from 10% to 33%, as you could see in the graph earlier. So off-budget spending continued and continued to remain one of the biggest ways of spending aid. And that's why the title of this uh, slide, you know, aid could be a curse or a blessing. The other aspect of aid that is very important to understand when you talk about aid to Afghanistan and perhaps to other developing countries is um, the issue of conditionalities. So by large, aid was given to Afghan states um, on a, on a number of conditions. And these conditions uh, kind of gained prominence and mandated the state to fully deliver them, I think, post-2012. And even prior to that, these uh, at the end of each of these four-year rolling pledging conferences, a framework, uh, a detailed framework would be developed that um, the Afghan government and uh, the international partners would meet up develop a framework that set out the number of targets that needed to be met every year. And as a result of uh, this uh, kind of exercise, a complex bureaucracy was set up uh, to implement, to monitor, to update the progress of these objectives. Um, so as you would expect, the process was very messy, you know, created backlogs of work, delayed some of development projects, you know, created corruption, clientelism, among other issues. Um, the most, however, 
the most problematic issue that, in my opinion, uh, that was created as a result of conditionality that was perhaps unforeseen was, or maybe it was foreseen, um, I do not know, was the crowding out effect of conditionalities. So aid conditionalities kind of created uh, well, the initial idea was that it would bring accountability, transparency, as you would expect, you know, you're giving money to a state and they need to be held accountable and it would bring efficiency and they would report on what they are spending the money on. But although there is a lack of research in this area in Afghanistan and small number of studies that do exist, they show that conditionalities implemented in the country kind of was counterproductive. Um, and then this proliferation of goals and targets and conventions and frameworks imposed on the government agencies and, uh, and, and line ministries, it turned the government or created this attitude within the government that kind of the instrument became more important than the end goal. And I think that's the biggest problem that was created as a result of conditionality. So each line ministry became like an agent trying to meet the targets in order for the next portion of aid money to be released and given to them. Uh, and this kind of, you know, crowded out the idea that, okay, we are trying to achieve development or trying to um, do some good and deliver and, and do service delivery. And instead, uh, a whole bunch of bureaucracy was created within these ministries and their job was how to meet the targets on the paper in order for the money to be released at the end of each tranche. And that undermined and sacrificed, I think, uh, service delivery and uh, created a cumbersome kind of administrative work uh, that created a lot of problems. The other dimension with regards to aid was the unpredictability and unpredictability of it. Um, I mean, it's imagine a government is a person. And suppose you have an, some amount of money in your pocket and that amount of money is fixed for four years. And in your final year, so let's say in your five, fourth year, you, you do not know what's going to happen in your fifth year. So the government of Afghanistan kind of faced the similar uncertainty every four year. So as it was said, the government's budget varied between um, $7 billion to $11 billion you know, during the peaks of aid and then during the lows of aid uh, on both military and uh, and civilian, the domestic resources or domestic revenue didn't exceed $3 billion at best. And at the end of every four year, the government would run out of pocket and then this unpredictability kind of prevents um, long-term thinking or fundamentally planning your development priorities and framework. So you would wait for a pledging conference to go smoothly and, you know, you would wait for, for a bunch of other countries to promise um, enough money. Uh, interestingly, the last of these uh, pledging conferences was in 2020 and it promised on annual basis. So they cho changed the four year rolling to annual. Anyway, the, the immediate uh, problem it created was that long term vision was sacrificed. And this uh, international arrangements to deliver aid, um, well, through the hard way, I think in my short experience in Afghanistan, I, I learned that uh, aid or arrangements to deliver aid is like a beast that cannot be tamed by, re by a recipient country. So primarily it is better and far more sustainable to develop an indigenous route to development along the way you can use aid carefully and very cautiously to support that route. Uh, there is no shortcuts uh, to economic prosperity. And I don't think this gradual and slow process should be cut short by a massive amount of aid because it would create much other bigger and other problems. Um, throughout this, so I spoke about two other things. One was policy failure and then the other one was corruption. So I, I thought these two are also very prominent themes throughout Afghanistan of, you know, uh, 2001 until 2021, the last two decades. So let's unpick a little bit about the policy failures or how policy was viewed. I think fragility, as you can see, defined by uh, this uh, 2018 study um, in, 
the study, I think, I believe the study actually focuses on Afghanistan, and these are the factors pertinent to Afghanistan. So security threat from, you know, unorganized non-state violences, uh, lack of legitimacy, weak capacity, and so on and so forth. Um, there are other definitions of fragility as well. You know, like the, the World Bank has the definition that a country should be eligible for grants from IDA, you know, International Development uh, Association, should receive UN peacekeeping mission or have had for the past three years, and scores very low on governance indicators. Yeah. And, and that country is considered as a weak state or fragile state. From a macro policy perspective, Fragility was largely ignored in policy decisions in Afghanistan. And it was a very, very late arrival. I think in 2017, the debate entered into the realm of development discussions. So uh, to, for any of these development frameworks and policy making to yield positive outcomes, you kind of have to understand the drivers of fragility and, and economic interventions from design to implementation cannot work if you don't know these sources of fragility very well. And the fact that this was largely ignored kind of hindered the development course by a lot. Um, the dominant perspective in Afghanistan was that most social and political issues had an economic uh, problem or root. Um, to quote the title of a paper, um, uh, an earning man will not rebel that was the kind of thinking that, uh, okay, uh, people's incomes are really low, let's give people money and then they will not fight. Uh, I think that fails massively to understand and appreciate uh, the diverse sources of fragility and causes of fragility. And uh, that was largely ignored. Um, I just one example I would like to pick, and that was the religious grievances. Yeah, so this, uh, th there's, all the different types of grievances. So this religious discourse or tool was used by radicals, you know, to legitimize their fight uh, and, and use it to ignite violence. Um, this, the importance of this tool or soft power kind of was largely ignored from 2001 all the way until very, very late uh, throughout the course of development. So for these public interventions to Kind of bring up you know modern governance systems democratic ideals they have to inevitably um, accept these contextual rigidities you know that comes within each country that exists within each country so Afghanistan is no exception of course it, it maybe was a late kind of uh, country to be democratized but it experience showed that an exclusionary development narrative uh, in a highly religious society that has its own historical uh, narratives and, uh, and, his and, and diverse uh, groups of people does not work. And it's kind of uh, these grievances amalgamate and then uh, rapidly kind of lends you know, legitimacy to violence and, and violence soon spreads. And as we saw, eventually um, the government collapsed and didn't manage to, you know, take root within Afghanistan. The other theme was corruption. I was actually thinking about this uh, this morning and how to present the idea of corruption because it's a personal interest of mine uh, research-wise, but uh, also a lot of people fail to understand, especially in the Western world, the gravity of corruption. You know, I found a quote and I thought this quote pretty much captures you know, the gravity of corruption in most developing countries. Afghanistan is not very, uh, very exception, not an exception in, in, with regards to corruption. I mean, this exists in mo most developing economies suffer from corruption. And this is an endemic all across. Uh, but especially in the case of Afghanistan, somebody said uh, from your birth certificate to your death certificate, whatever comes in between, somehow you have to bribe. And uh, that is true, unfortunately. Um, from your passport application to public contracts and how they are awarded to revenue departments, to education system, to patronages that exist across employment and to the police and military and the justice system, all of it is somehow linked or involved in, in, in corruption. 
um, it's pretty much the role of government is very, very important in understanding this, uh, the, the level of or the gravity of corruption in less developed economies. So like, like uh, the um, trios have said, 40% of the country's GDP um, comes, so the public expenditure forms 40% of the GDP. So the government is something that you cannot ignore. It exists in every aspect of life. The private sector is a negligible force in these less developed economies. So what the government does inevitably affects everything else and it has a domino effect on other aspects of life and the market. And when the government is involved in corruption, you could think of all the other uh, sectors, you know, being embroiled in such, in, in, in such endemic. Uh, the picture I've put there is uh, for, for a purpose. Basically, there's a neighborhood in Kabul city um, called Sherpur. I don't know if anyone has seen, but uh, if you look at the very recent videos of the Taliban capturing this region, they went to these palaces and they look very, very nice. It reminds you of all these, you know, Pablo Escobar style palaces and, and gangster style palaces. This entire region did not exist until 2010 and 2009, if I'm not mistaken. So it was a ruin. And then all of a sudden, all government officials uh, had a villa in this region, and they all look very, very nice, often rented out to foreign agencies, Western visitors, journalists, and that just sprung into existence. Now, I don't know if anyone else had this thought, but I, I had the opportunity to you know, spend some time away from Afghanistan and then go back. So visiting, I couldn't help wonder mathematically, if you think about it, if you churn in billions of dollars into the, one of the world's poorest countries, and then you do this for about two decades, and then at the end of the investment, the country still remains very, very poor. I mean, there has to be a problem. Um, one, one, one thing um, that could be said, and, and there is a lot of work that has been done on corruption, that investments did build stuff, did achieve some things, you know, on health sector, on uh, building schools and school enrollment went up, water projects, certainly that's a lot of good. But in part, I think these investments failed to achieve anything uh, because of the emergence of this uh, fantastically corrupt elite for the last for the last two decades, and that was as a result of you know large supplies of money, and all of this money was diverted away from Afghanistan, if not by a car load by a boat load, uh, and that didn't you know work out very well. For for a democratic system, I think to function and flourish, law and order existence of law and order is paramount you know the mechanism of punishment and reward um, or punishing the guilty or rewarding the good behavior enables trust and brings legitimacy and, and does a lot of good so these were some of the prominent features of development in afghanistan and i want i want to finish with saying that you know trust deficit between state and citizens remain very very um, um, what well, lack of trust deficit between the state and, 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 the, and the people continued to stay within the 20 years. Despite $160 billion of aid, um, the government did not achieve um, a level of you know, service delivery, a minimal level to deliver services. You know, state and non-state institutions remain ineffective. Um, and then the type of political system that was adopted, which is slightly beyond the realm of you know, economic discussions, was a very centralized exclusionary um, kind of approach that enhanced grievances of a diverse country uh, with uh, the, the political system that was adopted ended up with, uh, with a type of you know, less winners and more losers. So the way we judge the success of different governments today is with their ability to deliver services, right? And that's what's the most important thing. So if, if not so, then legitimacy is seriously questioned. And that was the case for the, for the Afghan state for the past 
20 years. And then unfortunately, uh, it all collapsed in, uh, in August of 2021. So I hope all of that makes sense. Uh, and uh, I want to end here. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, um, let's open the floor for questions or any. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Zoya, Dr. Amy, thank you so much for the comprehensive and inter interesting presentation on Afghanistan economic development. We all learned a lot. We have also received a huge number of questions through social media. And let me put some questions here with you. Uh, the first question is, the economic disruption combined with a severe drought and the coronavirus pandemic has worsened poverty and left millions without work and facing acute hunger. Please elaborate and how do you look at this? Or shall I put two to three questions at once? Well, I think, let me respond to this question and then I would have to excuse myself to another meeting, but Dr. Rahimi will be taking uh, the other uh, questions. Um, uh, yes, so uh, as, uh, as I had shown on, on one of the graphs, um, uh, poverty stood at about 47% uh, prior to the COVID uh, pandemic. And then since then, uh, we, we, uh, the, the economy suffered a huge shock as a result of both the uh, pandemic, but also the political shock that came in, especially with the, um, with the political collapse last year. Um, so a few um, um, institutions, including us, the BYU Institute, also the UNDP and the World Bank, um, had um, undertaken some, some analysis and projections. And, uh, everyone sort of tended to believe that poverty has, of course, uh, worsened uh, in the past two years, uh, uh, even prior to the political uh, collapse. Uh, everyone estimated that the poverty would have um, increased um, um, to about 75 percent. And even some other institutions like the UNDP went out saying that poverty could be as much as 90 percent in the country. And this is huge uh, because of the, um, the, the, uh, the magnitude of the economic shock that Afghanistan um, uh, assumed. And with the political regime collapse since last year, I think the situation has further uh, deteriorated. We are facing the, um, um, an extensive uh, food uh, insecurity. Uh, a capital of, uh, flight has uh, has happened. Um, investment has stopped, and and just imagine that three hundred thousand people uh, who were um, engaged in who were employed by the security sector in the country just lost their their income, their uh, the salaries that they received from the government, um, and uh, and in addition to those, the thousands of people who were engaged in the private sector they have lost their their income sources. So I think uh, the country is going through a huge economic uh, crisis, a food insecurity, and hunger is, 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 is threatening the country. And it is uh, quite a humanitarian crisis. The country is right now going through a humanitarian crisis right now. Thank you very much. Uh, let me put other questions here. Uh, since the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan in mid-August, the conflict stricken nation has been dealing not only with political turmoil, but also a severe economic crisis and increasing poverty. How do you see it? And what is reality? What did the, like, why did the Afghan economy collapse? Uh, Dr. Rahimi. Thank you. Uh, I think the uh, last part of that question, we try to answer it in part throughout this presentation. So there are several uh, factors um, you could associate the, the collapse um, that could be from, from an economic point of view is what we discussed today. From a political point of view, there are other uh, you know, reasons why the collapse happened, but in general, the state failed to achieve legitimacy and take up root and garner popular support in order to go forward. And uh, an independent type of government 
uh, is not a sustainable government. And this was known throughout the two decades in Afghanistan. And uh, well, the fact that uh, when that aid was cut and the withdrawal happened, um, the state also collapsed. Um, to answer that question, you need hours and hours in full. I think in part, all of this, all of the discussions we had kind of tries to answer that question, why it collapsed. Uh, and the other part of the question, I think, was mostly answered by uh, Dr. Julia earlier on as well, that uh, the country is going through a humanitarian crisis. Um, all of the aid and the semi uh, functional institutes that were uh, operating within the country, state and non-state institutions. Uh, most of them faced collapse and most of them went into crisis. The government currently uh, is run by a uh, bunch of people who has no expertise. And then during the last year, there has been a brain drainage as well that most experts who, or expertise that have been developed over the last 20 years have also left the country. Now, uh, um, whether and how this is going to change depends on a number of political uncertainties, uh, such as recognition, such as how the Taliban are going to uh, deal with the rest of the world, whether they will understand and appreciate uh, the sensitivities and the fact that you have to live together with other countries in the world uh, uh, or not. And the fact that they have, uh, there, there should, there's also one thing that I would like to add that internally they have uh, not shown that they've learned from the past much. They have been uh, very, very brutal in suppressing uh, women's rights and uh, their presence in general within the society has been constrained and limited to, um, to levels beyond imagination. Um, but also, you know, suppressing other minorities around the country. And uh, I think the biggest difference between how the Taliban currently rule the country and uh, what we see as the government is this philosophical difference that uh, they believe that the government has some sort of divine legitimacy, you know, that you have to respect them and it's their given birthright. Whereas uh, we live in a, in, different, in, a, in a philosophically different era that the government is a selected number of people elected by the people that should serve the people. You know, this philosophical difference, I think, explains much, much, of, much of their, their method and the way they see the governance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Uh, sorry, thank you, Dr. Luthi. Uh, there's uh, the questions that you have just mentioned, um, however, like how serious is the human humanitarian situation in Afghanistan? Like how has the humanitarian crisis affected women and girls? And what, what makes the humanitarian crisis the result of an economic crisis? Like the, it's all uh, integrated questions, like can increasing foreign assistance in the humanitarian crisis and what should be done to address Afghanistan's humanitarian crisis? It's all interrelated. I think you, you can already guess my answer that I'm not very optimistic and uh, very keen on foreign aid being the solution to any of the problems. Uh, but uh, in the short term, perhaps, you know, some immediate relief can help. But um, it is by no means, and this is uh, in, in my opinion, and I believe there must be people who would uh, disagree, uh, that aid and foreign assistance is not going to help. And I say this from experience uh, for the last 20 years, it did not help. So it is not going to be uh, the savior moving forward. The country is in a humanitarian crisis and uh, there are, the service delivery is really, really minimal. Domestic revenues are not enough or sufficient. Uh, so certain relief packages may help if spent in a much targeted manner and in a, in a uh, specific way that reaches the people, because you have to take into account that this foreign assistance that is given to Afghanistan out of every dollar, if it's off budget, you know, that study that I quoted earlier on, 20 cent of it reaches the end user or even less. The rest of that money is lost in the overhead charges and the rest of the services along the way. So if you give a hundred dollars, uh, less than $20 will reach the family or the poor that is being targeted. 
So it is not going to, and that's a, just a standard practice. Now you could think of uh, all these other problems and the Taliban diverting those aid to spend it for their own purposes and means since they are the de facto rulers of the country. So aid is not going to be very effective. By no means there is no humanitarian crisis. I mean, currently schools are shut for girls. Um, families who a lot of people have lost their employment and because of precautionary savings, all the demand, there's a demand shock that uh, people have just stopped spending due to these uncertainties. Uh, and that creates all sorts of you know, production issues along the way. So businesses are being hurt, all of that. Um, so that humanitarian crisis and the economic crisis are there. Uh, the way forward, I'm afraid that's a million dollar question. I, I do not know, as there's no simple answer. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rahimi. It's one more question related to foreign aid. Like, what is the current situation of foreign aid to Afghanistan? Like, how can the international community ensure the longevity of the development projects in Afghanistan? Means, what is the situation right now? So, politically, you have to have a government that is recognized by the uh, rest of the world, and that then leads to a set of uh, mechanisms set up through which, you know, money physically can be transferred to a country's central bank, and then there would be some oversight through the World Bank or IMF or some other development institutions. And then projects are designed, as I discussed earlier, and then these projects are implemented. It's a very messy process, a lot gets lost, and it's, uh, it requires a lot of expertise. You're talking about a large design of projects to, to actually have some sort of impact. Uh, with the collapse, the Central Bank of Afghanistan and the banking sector uh, was put in a, um, sanctions, in, in sanctions, if you like, or they were blacklisted or they weren't allowed to, banks weren't allowed to um, deal with them, but uh, a few exceptions were issued by the US Treasury and some other authorities, allowing certain banks to be able to deal with the Central Bank of Afghanistan. So for the last six months, I think all of those restrictions have been removed. So there are no restrictions in, in order. In, in fact, the US authorities actually encouraged private banks and other banks to go and do business with the Central Bank of Afghanistan and help transfer these development packages. Different countries announced different levels of aid, but this is uh, all less than uh, $700, $800 million compared to $6 billion. You know, the difference between million and a billion has to be demonstrated visually because um, it's a huge difference. So by no means it's going to meet those, uh, those needs. Uh, but I should also stress, you know, it is not going to help even if the $6 billion was sent. We will end up perhaps in a similar situation. Uh, an, alter an alternative route should be sought. And I think that's a contextual indigenous solution. Thank you. Uh, let me put another question from here, uh, Facebook Live. Uh, what are the impacts of the U.S. presence, uh, presence on the economic development of Afghanistan? Like, what is the impact of U.S. presence in economic development of Afghanistan? Um, since 2021, there is no presence. So if, if it's recent presence, I think the U.S. did announce, if, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, a very large package, aid package of around uh, 600, over $600 million to be sent to Afghanistan since 2000, uh, August 2021. Yeah, this is post collapse. <clears throat> Prior to that, the US was the leading country in all fronts, including the uh, development aid that was given to Afghanistan. Um, all of the military expenditure was given directly by the US. Alongside that, around two billion was given towards the civilian slash development budget. So it was the US that actually financed all of this. And when they withdraw, the rest of the countries followed. So I, I don't know if um, so since 2000, August of 2021, uh, they've been very, very cautious. There were some negotiations between their representatives and the Taliban in Doha in Qatar, but, um, 
as a result of the Taliban's decision to not allow girls schools to reopen, I think those, those discussions halted, uh, were halted as well. But I am very, very skeptic of those discussions and whether they are going to, you know, um, there, there are going to be some red lines to force the Taliban to, you know, respect certain rules. I'm very skeptical of those decisions. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, like the foreign aid is not going to help uh, to Afghanistan. So, um, like, uh, what are the natural resources that can Afghanistan or international community better harness to the vast potential of the country's natural resources? Like, is there very good question? <clears throat> very good question. Um, there are a lot of natural resources in Afghanistan. They are unextracted. There is oil, there is gas, uh, there are um, precious stones and rare elements that are needed, <clears throat> like uh, lithium, I think. Um, so potentially, potentially they are, there, uh, there, there is treasure on the ground. And this could be, you know, this could be extracted and this could help finance some of the needs in the next 10 years, let's say. Um, or 20 years, uh, but it's not the ultimate answer. So there are two major problems with Afghanistan's natural resources. Uh, and, I, and I say the word potentially there with a lot of care because, uh, and, and I want to emphasize it again, that potentially that is there for the last 20 years. So the first, the first problem is that in the last 20 years, there were incentive packages, there were programs and there were um, exhibitions, even in India, there were these trilateral exhibitions, um, trade, um, trade exhibitions uh, between India, US and Afghanistan that was held in India, several rounds, um, to encourage investment in Afghanistan. So to you know, encourage FDI, inflow of investment, none of it worked. The private sector never got interested uh, in investing in Afghanistan, simply because of security, but also a lot of other technical difficulties exist. Uh, I very recently, I think, uh, wrote a paper on China and Afghanistan's relationship. The Chinese came and tried to invest on two different sectors. One of them was a copper mine, uh, and the other one was in oil and gas in north of Afghanistan. Both of those projects were over, they were multi-billion projects, 30 year long. And that's the kind of strategic long-term projects that are investments that are needed in order to transform, and you need a lot more of them. Uh, both of those projects failed, didn't even, didn't even pick up from the ground. And there were loads of political, legal, and social challenges. One of them was, you know, this, and just there, there, there is a requirement to understand the strategic importance of a project, a multi-billion project from a government side. Uh, my case studies um, showed that, or our case studies showed that uh, uh, the officials didn't really understand how strategically important this was and all they cared was about their private gains. So the kind of, you know, these projects failed and none of it moved forward uh, and, and US companies never came to Afghanistan to invest in the first place. So there needs to be some sort of homework, you know, doing, preparing the environment and then potentially these natural resources could provide some sort of uh, medium term solution, but these are finite resources, you know, other sources of uh, financing should be sought in the long term. Thank you, uh, Dr. Latif Rahimi. Uh, now we will have our last questions. Like, uh, it's like, how far do you think that Afghanistan will ever experience the higher economic growth rates under the rule of a Taliban-led government or not? Or what should be the government policy for the economic development and poverty alleviations? Yeah, we will conclude with this. As the last thing I want to do is serve as an as a, as a advisor to the Taliban government, I'm afraid. <laughs> but definitely, um, I... Uh, it's, it's a worrying and it troubles me personally and um, you know, on, on the macro level as well that to see that uh, all the achievements in the past has been lost and the current rulers of the country does not understand or pay attention 
to the well-being and the prosperity and the education and these primary needs or human rights, if you like, of, of the citizens that they are going to rule. Uh, I think the first thing they need to understand is that these are individuals and citizens and not subjects. So they need to, I think the Taliban need to understand that uh, people of Afghanistan are human beings and they have certain human basic rights that is incumbent upon them to respect those human rights as, as the rulers of the land. Uh, so far, they have failed to show any of such, such understanding. So um, ho I hope they do, and I hope this changes, and uh, there is a change, and this humanitarian crisis is eased. Um, but um, in my honest and humble opinion, I do not know how it's going to go ahead. The future is very unknown and dependent on a number of uh, conditions and uncertainties that we don't know. Thank you very much, Dr. Rahimi. Uh, finally, here we come to the end of the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Zoya and Dr. Rahimi for the insightful presentation. We would also like to thank our participants and audience for their wonderful questions. We will have a lot of, like we have still some questions, but due to time constraints, we are unable to take them. Have a nice day and see you all our upcoming events. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Thank you for inviting us. And uh, Dr. Julia had to leave for another meeting. Thank you for all the participants and the questions for listening patiently. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amy.